Good morning, Southside Bible Church. Good morning, brother. Some special welcome. Any guests we have with us this morning, we are grateful to have you. I pray that you'll be encouraged as we worship our God together now through His Word. This morning is quite a morning for us. We've spent four years studying the book of Romans together, so if you'll turn to Romans chapter 16. We began in January of 2020 just with deep prayer that uh, revival would move through the book of Romans in our midst. And we, we opened the first Sunday and we looked at many revivals through church history that God used through the book of Romans, one of the great ones being Martin Luther and, of course, Augustine. So my notes, as I'm looking back, they were so optimistic. The, they said the revival of 2020, the revival of 2021, 2022, and t- today, 2023, still praying and asking the Lord for that. I was asking God to meet us in a powerful way as we looked at the gospel of Jesus Christ every week together, uh, week in, week out. Um, I just, I don't want to give a 10 cent finish to an infinite gospel. And I wanted our hearts to be taken up and to rise above contemporary Christianity in our midst of mediocrity, lukewarmness, and just meandering on our way to glory. God is worthy of our, of our hearts and our lives and our obedience. When I read at the end in verse 27 this morning, the only wise God through Jesus Christ be the glory forever. Amen. I want the weight of our God, our Father, His church, His gospel, and our conformity to Him and our desire to advance the nations of this gospel to not sit idle on our hearts and lives, that we would offer up our bodies a living sacrifice to God so He is worthy. And as God often does, he, he worked in ways that I didn't expect when we began this book. I wanted to study it and read it and pray over it, um, that we would just all be so alive to the gospel. But what I didn't expect was three months in, we, we had COVID hit. And we were locked at home with a virus that we knew very little about. I was preaching into a camera when I needed the body like never before. Later, I was preaching in a parking lot. Um, Preaching, then we came inside to mass and distancing and then preaching with a threat of fines and shutting down the church and then losing my brain during COVID uh, when it affected me. Just lots went on. The government kind of rocked our worlds. We were getting truth, became very tricky from even our media. There was a deep division in our country between liberals and conservatives like never before, fell into a recession. Um, Seeing more of my own sin through this journey. But I'm sitting here this morning with a, a clarity of the gospel that I've never had so clear from this season of why we exist. I've been humbled before this God, a deeper love for the brethren, my shepherds, heart for this body has doubled. My deepest love and desire for what the church can be in truth and love and unity and gospel advance, what we're to be about. How do we trust God in every high and stormy gale? Just seeing what he's done in our hearts over the last four years, this is not the same church. It's just deeper, more focused, suffering so well. More love to thee, O Christ, has happened. What took place in our church plant in Lakewood, watching all of you just take hold of it and going and laboring and serving and painting and doing everything that you could. It's beautiful what he's doing. And so I pray, this is not what I thought four years ago. I was kind of picturing the spirit blowing through South Denver and just hundreds of thousands of people getting saved. But it was him putting deep in our hearts the gospel to believe it and to share it. And there are many of you who are giving your lives to do that. And so I pray that God would fan it into a flame, that we would be faithful one day at a time, equipping and supporting those who are being called out full time. Pray that we're all seeing our calls and our roles as significant, whether we're a toe or a mouth, whether we're a frontier missionary or an accountant serving as a deacon and 
leading your children to Christ. Whatever it is, I want you to see that we're, we're a, a family, unified one, all with different gifts working together to lift high the cross of Christ. So our finale this morning is, how do you wrap up a letter like Romans? <laughs> well, let's look at Paul's answer because it, it fits. His, his conclusion fits perfect. I, I couldn't have could have never came up with anything how to close Romans, and he, by the Holy Spirit, it's perfect. So let's look at it. Um, verse 25 is where we're going to narrow in. Now to him who is able to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery which has been kept secret for long ages past, but now is manifested and by the scriptures of the prophets according to the commandment of the eternal God, has been made known to all the nations, leading to the obedience of faith, to the only wise God through Jesus Christ, be the glory forever. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your love and mercy, the way you've met us in this book and the things that you've done in our lives, the things that we would have never planned or anticipated, but you are using to make us into the image of Jesus Christ. I thank you that you don't work according to our plans, but we come under your perfect plan of how you will complete the work that you began in each and every life sitting here this morning that has faith in Jesus Christ. God, I pray, meet us in the conclusion this morning by your Holy Spirit through the truth of these words. And it's in Christ's name that we do pray. Amen. So in Romans... 16, 21 through 24, Paul's going to give some more greetings to Rome from the saints who are with him. So last time in verses 1 through 16, Paul's greeting all the saints in Rome, and now he's, he's sending the greetings of all those who are with him as he's writing this. And we're going to spend very little time on this because we need to park on Paul's doxology. <laughs> it's as if we see the contagion of Paul's hearts for the saints. It's, it's gripped their hearts. And they're saying, now send our love to the church. Send our greeting. And so you just see this intimacy among believers. There's a spontaneity in their affection toward one another. So greet Timothy, the, the great protege of Paul. And we have first and second Timothy from him. Greet Lucius and Jason and Sosipater, my kinsmen, the fellow Jews, Lucius in Acts 13.1 was the leader of the church in Acts, and most people believe that's that Lucius. Jason is mentioned in Acts 17.1 through 7. He's dragged out by a mob because of the kindness that he showed to Paul. Sosipater was mentioned in Acts 24, taking the Gentile offering to Jerusalem. And then we have Tertius. He's the one, the amanuensis. He's the secretary recording all Paul's words, and just he gets to pop in there and say, I greet you. Gaius, Paul's host, 1 Corinthians 1.14, Paul baptized him, and he has a big enough home that the whole church is meeting there uh, in hospitality. Erastus is the city treasurer. It just begins to show how diverse this church was, and Greek Cortus, the brother, sends his greetings. And so our, our application as we're just moving into doxology is, again, the reality of genuine Christian fellowship. We have a master and a slave coming together to worship. We have Romans and Greeks. We have Jew and Gentiles. We have rich and poor. We, we have a, a oneness beyond all human distinctions in the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is what Jesus does to his people. He unifies us. He makes us one. Verse 24, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Now to him, the only wise God be glory forever. God the Father. It's just so sweet. Line after line after line, phrase after phrase. We have spent so long looking at nouns, verbs, objects, connectors like therefore, and we've just turned it over from every angle for four years, and the conclusion is now to Him. <laughs> Amen. If I learned anything these four years, this whole gospel, life, everything is from God, through God, and to Him. To Him be the glory forever. I pray you walk away just saying, God is great. Amen. Worship Him. Adore Him. Salvation is from Him. We're not going to spend our days making much of us. Just marvel at the God that we've looked at and studied. To Him 
who is able to establish you. And this one just jumped out at me this week thinking about that. You're, you're, you're concluding the book of Romans. And, and, and I pray that it, it hits you because he closes. And, and Paul could focus on any attribute of God, anything that he's done. There, there is a list of infinity of what would you grab out as you're closing Romans. And he picks one that I didn't expect. Now to him who is able to strengthen you, we must need that. Maybe you need that this morning, wherever you're at. There's a, there's a God who can strengthen you for whatever you're facing, whatever you're going through. That's what this gospel can bring about. He can strengthen you this morning. He's able. The God of the universe is able. I think, remember the turning point in Romans 3.21, the darkness of humanity, and he says, but now, but now God has done something to save us because we couldn't save ourselves. He's the God who's able. He was able to bring about salvation. He's able to make you stand in his presence blameless with great joy. God is able to establish you. I like this word. It means to make a movable, stabilize someone, or to make firm. He can, he can establish you this morning. He can make you firm where nothing can blow you over from the devil and all the things that are coming at you. God can establish you. He's able. He's able to make you a rock against the world, the flesh, and the devil. This gospel is able. Psalmist said, lead me to a rock that is higher than I. Wait upon the Lord and you'll mount up with wings like eagles and walk and not grow weary and run and not get weak. How does he do it? How does he make us established and firm and strong in this world? Does he just kind of put his hands on you and say, firm? There's a way. The rest of this doxology is going to show us. And if you look in verse 25, <laughs> he gives us four ways. I'm going to make you rock solid according to my gospel, by the preaching of Jesus Christ, a mystery that has been kept secret for ages has now been manifested, and it's going to lead to the obedience of faith. These are the ways that God is going to make you firm. It's not just he's going to wake up and I just feel firm. There's a way that God's going to do this. And I want you to begin with me according to my gospel. In the beginning of Romans 1, he calls it God's gospel, the gospel of Jesus Christ, my gospel that God gave to me. So I just want you to hear this. Nothing else will establish you. It's a simple principle. How many of us spend our whole lives looking for other things to establish us, to strengthen us, to hold us up? You might be in trials right now looking for everything other than the gospel to establish you. We run to the world's things, our own thinking, our own cleverness, and it will never make you firm and establish you. The gospel is going to do it. You get strong by the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what's going to establish me. God strengthens us with good news. And the gospel is good news of what he's done to save us. And that good news, he says in, in verse 25, is the preaching of Jesus Christ. The, the preaching of Jesus Christ is the good news. You take Christ out of the Bible, and this Bible gives you the worst news in the history of the world. It's just all bad news. It's dark. It's black. Take Jesus out, and we're all sinners condemned to go to hell forever. This is a horrible book. Put Jesus in it, and it is the best book that has ever been known to man. There's a, there's a gospel of good news because of Jesus Christ. Put him in it. Write him into history from a virgin's womb, coming into a manger, dying on a cross, being buried, resurrected, and now at the right hand of God, offering salvation to all who will believe is good news. And the good news is according to the revelation of the mystery which has been kept secret for long ages past, but now is manifested. So according to the revelation of the mystery, there, there's a mystery and I said before, it's not trying to solve like a murder. It's the gospel of salvation from sin through the work of Jesus Christ. And Paul's going to give three participle phrases to describe this mystery. 
And these little participles just happen to encompass the history of the world. So three participles, you get to understand the whole world this morning. First, it's been kept secret for long ages past. The word means silent or non-observed. Because this mystery, I want you to hear this, it's just jammed through the whole Old Testament. You can't read anywhere where this mystery isn't, but it was a mystery. It was talked about Jesus and types and shadows and figures and cloudy and promises. I remember when I was a kid, uh, I think it was alphabets when I would eat cereal, and there was a guy named the Hardy Boys. You guys remember the Hardy? Most of you don't, but the older people are shaking. And, and on this box, there was this stuff written that you couldn't read. And in the box at the bottom, you pulled out this little red magnifying glass. And you would hold that up, and you're like, I can see. I can read it. And the Old Testament, it's always there. And now I get this new lens called Jesus Christ, and I see the beauty and the glory that was a mystery that I missed for thousands of years. Now you see it clearly, and Paul is so excited saying the mystery has been revealed. The counsel of his wisdom, the outworking of the eternal plan of God. You sit here in an infinite plan that God has planned throughout history. And we've looked at it. We looked at eternity past to eternity future just in Romans 8. The mystery of his will, of this gospel. And this is so important to God that two-thirds of your Bible was a mystery that was kept secret. Setting the stage for thousands of years as a backdrop so that when this diamond came into the world that was born into Bethlehem's manger, we would, we would be able to see something so beautiful but now is manifested. And it's too easy to walk by this statement. Thousands of shadowy years, 400 years of silence between Malachi and this, and this diamond is now placed on the prong in darkness in Bethlehem. And he's the light of the world. This is why time existed. He's been manifested. So that great mystery was hidden for so long it's now been revealed, and this man named Simeon took him and said, Behold, let thy bondservant depart in peace, for my eyes have seen thy salvation. This is what it's all been promising and looking to, and here he is. The mystery has been manifested. That's why we come here this morning. And he says it's by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandment. That word is according to the determination or to the decree of the eternal God. And so this whole thing was the plan of God, his determination, his decree, and it's by the scriptures and the prophets. The Old Testament saints saw this through a lens of promise, and, and now we see it through fulfillment. It's as if someone turned the lights on in the Old Testament. And why read the Old Testament? Well, here's why. What was shadowy is now the brilliance of the radiance of God's glory. His son is beautiful. And we can see Jesus through the whole Testament now and the beauty of what God was preparing and predicting and promising for us. Ephesians 1.9 said, He made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his kind intention, which he purposed in him, Jesus, with a view to an administration suitable to the fullness of the times. That is the summing up of all things in Christ things in the heavens and things upon the earth. He's been manifested to sum up all of history. Everything has been pointing to this moment. The Bible paints a portrait of Christ and his saving work that he would perform on behalf of sinners. And he says it's been made known to all the nations. So the plan and purpose of God is now that the gospel would go to the ends of the earth to make disciples of all the nations to proclaim and share and, and reveal this mystery that's been manifested in Jesus Christ. This mystery kept secret that the Gentiles were far off and without hope and have now been brought near into this promised gospel was manifested for 33 years on this earth. The God-man has been made known to the nations. And so what this says is you can't keep a lid on this you can't hide this under a bushel. Our calling now is that this message goes out. Christ has come, 
And he's the hope of glory. That's the mystery unfolded. In Christ, the nations can call upon him and be saved. The way of salvation to have peace with God. The whole book, Paul says, I am not ashamed of this gospel because it's the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. This gospel is now to go out to nations. And I want to park on this last part, leading to the obedience of faith. What, a, what an amazing gospel. What's come? And Paul's saying I, it's to go out and, and there's a purpose. I want it to lead to the obedience of faith. So this mystery has been revealed to nations to bring about obedience of faith. This is awesome. Faith produces obedience and it produces strength and establishing on, in this whole picture. Flip to Romans 1.5. I, I want you to see all of Romans is bookended in this phrase. <clears throat> this is big to Paul and I want it to be big to you, to our own hearts. Please don't miss what Romans is about. Verse 5, Romans 1, 5. So Jesus Christ was raised from the dead, through whom, Paul says, we have received grace and apostleship to do what? To bring about the obedience of faith among all the Gentiles, all the nations. Right here, same thing. It's going to go to the nations uh, uh, for what? For his name's sake, for his glory. And we're going to see that's the same place he's going to close. He's going to do the exact same thing. Verse 26 of chapter 16, um, it's been made known to all the nations, leading to the obedience of faith. To the only wise God through Jesus Christ be the glory forever. Amen. So we're just bookended on both sides. This gospel is to go to the nations to bring about the obedience of faith so that God would get all the glory. And at the close, this gospel is to bring about obedience of faith so God gets all the glory. Don't miss then what all in between has been working towards. Please, let's grab hold of this this morning. This is what Paul is after and it's, it's what I'm after this morning. Father, please let us get obedience of faith. Don't let any soul walk out of Romans and miss this point. I pray, make it clear through an unclear preacher. I pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. So I don't want you to miss this. It's not to bring about obedience, which is what the whole world thinks. I'm just going to change my way. I'm going to live a little better life. I'm going to be moral. I'm going to help at the soup kitchen. And I just, my, I got good morals now. I'm a Christian and I got higher ethics than the rest of the world. And so this gospel just makes me obedient. I, I obey. And, and yet, Paul says, I, don't, I, I want it to bring about the obedience of faith. And there's a big difference. One was the Pharisees, and they tried to just obey externally, and they never could get there. That is not what God wanted. He doesn't just want external obedience. He wants faith from a new heart that issues forth in a transformed life. So if you're here visiting, this is the difference between going to hell or going to heaven. Whether you get this or don't, is right here in this one little phrase. You can't walk away from this letter without understanding this. <clears throat> this whole letter has been to get you to this place. So it's not, here's your duty. <laughs> Go live it. Hope you guys do well. I'll pray for you. Work hard and get God to like you. Uh, I read a guy today who said, my first 27 years of life, I've spent the next 27 trying to make up for what I did. That's not the gospel. It's not. Don't, don't let me just clean up and live better. I'm going to come to Southside, start reading my Bible. I just got to get better. That is not what this is about. Let me justify my existence, get a job, have a good marriage, do all these things, and I, I, then I deserve to live. I just want to justify my existence. And that's what this whole world is doing. And Paul is saying, this gospel is way bigger than that. And I pray if that's where you're at this morning, listen now where we're going to go, because there's salvation involved here. Uh, flip back to chapter one. I'm throwing you all over the place. Um, sorry. You'll remember back, this was right, on the 500 years Reformation going on. Um, I'm not ashamed of the gospel in verse 16, because it's the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, what's it? 
It's the gospel, right? For in it, the gospel, and, and it's a subjective genitive, which means a God kind of righteousness is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the righteous man shall live by faith. And so we, we, we began to see that this gospel can save because in it, there's a way to get a God kind of righteousness put to our account. And so I want you to see that what started the Reformation was Luther trying to achieve that righteousness so he could be right with God. And he realized, I can never do it. He's in a monastery confessing sins all day long. It's hard to get in trouble in a monastery, but he was just gripped. And finally, when he realized the righteousness that God requires is given to me by faith. It's given to me. Jesus' righteousness is given to me by faith. That's what this gospel is about, and we're going to flesh that out if you've just heard that for the first time. So come with me on a journey. I get a four years, I get to do in five minutes. So let's go. Remember the three chapters of the book. Where do we begin with the gospel? The bad news. You got to know you're lost. You got to know the bad news or the good news will never be important to you. And so we began that Paul is showing there's no one righteous before God. We're all red-blooded sinners to our very core of our being. And so there's no one, when you look at God's righteousness and who he is, nobody is righteous. And Paul says, well, are we better than they in Romans 3? Not at all. We've already declared that both Jews and Greeks are all under the dominion of sin, as it's written. So listen to your picture. There's none righteous. What about me? No, not even one. There's none who understands. There's none who seeks for God. All have turned aside. They've become useless. There's none who does good. No, not even one. And so our problem is, is that we're not righteous. And Paul spent three chapters because he wanted you to know that. And we spend our whole lives saying, I don't want to hear that. <laughs> I'm not that bad. Have you seen my neighbor? Have you seen my brother? And we just always want to spend our whole lives saying, I'm not that bad. And Paul's making you look in the mirror and say, you are that bad. You, you, you're not righteous. You don't love God from your heart. You love yourself and you're trying to work to get him to accept you and appease you. And therefore in Romans 1.18, the wrath of God is upon us because we're unrighteous. Not for a wrong reason, for a right reason, his wrath is on us. So what do we do with that? Well, we run to the law. We run to the law and say, I got to get right with God. I got to start going to church. I, I've got to improve. I've got to justify myself before God by my performance. And we spend our whole lives trying to do enough to get God to accept us. And Paul makes it very clear in Romans 3.19. We know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law. Here's why the law was given, not as a chin-up bar or a ladder, that every mouth may be shut before God. I'm unrighteous. And that all the world might become accountable to God because by the works of the law, trying to do enough good things under the law, no flesh will ever be justified in his sight. You can labor under the law. Would we sing, not the labors of my hands can fulfill thy law's demands. I cannot and he says, um, no flesh will be justified, for through the law comes the knowledge of sin. The, the, the law is a mirror to show you that you're sinful, not to clean your face up on it and get right. It, it, it's supposed to work to say, you're guilty. You're a sinner. Look it. So there's a big problem. And this is one for the ages that only the wise God that we're going to worship at the end can fix. We're unrighteous by our heritage. By being um, connected to Adam, when he sinned, it says it was imputed to all of our accounts. So we all come into the world spiritual stillborns because of what Adam did. We come in with our nature turned inward, and now we're selfish by nature, so our very nature is, is corrupted. And then our actions come forth, and we have sinful actions. So we got a bad heritage, we got a bad heart, and we got bad behavior. So the wrath of God is rightfully upon us. So to be in the presence of God, please hear this. You got to be perfectly righteous because he says nothing unrighteous can be in my presence. And, and so how do you fix that? 
unrighteous people with a holy, righteous God, and I can't be right till I'm brought back into his presence. How can I ever get back into his presence? Do you see how deep and pervasive the problem is? World religions have been trying to fix it for the history of the world, and they can't. Because they're like, go do this, go try this, go do some kind of performance, fly your planes into a world tower, trade center. There's no hope to fix this in man. Humanity has tried everything. Religion cannot fix your problem. The wrath of God is upon you if you have not believed in the gospel that Paul has been sharing with us in the gospel of Romans. The gospel of the wise God who architected a plan, kept it hidden, and has now revealed it in his son. Flip back to Romans 3.21. I'm going to try to quit talking so much because I'm going to go way over. But you got to hear this. You got to hear this. And when I'm gone, there's a dear brother who's going to preach it to you again. Um, Verse 21. But now, (laughs) this is what God did. Apart from the law, there's, there's there's another way to try to get righteous. Apart from the law, the righteousness of God, again, that's a God kind of righteousness, has been manifested. He, he showed another way to get righteous. And, it's, and it was witnessed by the law and the prophets. It was in there talking about it, revealing it. It's always been there. And it's the righteousness of God that comes through faith in Jesus Christ. And in case you missed it, for all those who believe, it's now by faith, believing in what Jesus Christ has done. There's no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Here's the remedy. You can be justified, and that word means declared righteous. So the whole gospel is you're not righteous. And now it's saying in this gospel, there's a righteousness revealed. And so how do I get justified before God? How can God say I'm righteous when I know I'm not? Being justified as a gift, so it's free, By his grace, meaning God does it all, you do none of it. God is the giver, you're the receiver. Through the redemption, which is in Christ Jesus, Jesus went up on a cross and he paid the ransom price. The soul that sins must die. And Jesus died on that cross in our place. And God pierced him through for our transgressions. And God displayed him publicly as a propitiation, which means to appease the wrath of God. So the wrath of God against our sins was averted on the Son of God so that now there's no wrath left for you. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. By faith, he says, uh, verse 28, we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. There's a way to get righteous apart from you working. It's by faith in what Jesus Christ has done. And so my question is, how can God declare you righteous when you're not? That doesn't feel right. He can't just say, Ken Murphy's righteous, because I'm not. And this is the whole book of Romans. We've gone over it a lot. It's called logizomai, and it means imputation. And the imputation is that all the sins that I've ever committed, past, present, and future, were imputed to Jesus Jesus went up on that cross and he bore the wrath of God for every sin that I ever committed. He was punished for every sin. You don't have to pay double jeopardy. Jesus, why else would he be on a cross if he wasn't bearing the wrath for our sins? And the other half of the gospel that I didn't hear until I graduated seminary is that the righteousness of Christ who came into this world and he was perfect righteousness. And God says, I will take that and it'll get so my it to your account. Please hear that. So that you can sit here this morning as righteous as Jesus before the eye of the judge, God the Father. And he can look at you and say, you are not guilty because your sins were paid for and you now have the righteousness of Jesus in your account. I love this gospel because in it, the righteousness of God is revealed. There's a way to get righteousness apart from the works of the law, but by faith, believing in what God has done in Jesus Christ is the way to be made right with God. And the God of the universe will say justified. You're righteous. A God kind of righteousness dwells in you. I pray we never get over that 
Southside Bible Church. So I want you to hear this loud and clear. When God says Ken Murphy is righteous, he has a basis. The basis is that he didn't forgive his son and punish my sins and that he gave me Jesus' righteousness and put it to my account. Christ's righteousness is the only basis and ground of my justification. You bring and add nothing to your justification. Please get that. I meet believer after believer still trying to add something. Nothing can be added. One garment of your own work ruins the garment. One stitch and you'll ruin it. I want you to look away from anything in you and believe only in Jesus Christ for his full righteousness. So, how does that bring about the obedience of faith? Well, Romans 6.1, Paul says, what shall we say to this? Are we to continue in sin that grace might increase? You know, you know who says that? People who are just obeying. Pharisees. <laughs> if everything's forgiven, I'm just going to go sin. This is, this is great. This is get out of jail free card. And Paul says, that's not the obedience of faith. And the believers don't ask that question, right? You know what believers say? All I want to do is live for Jesus Christ the rest of I want to offer up my body a living sacrifice to you. That's what faith does. Faith changes and transforms. When you get what I just went over, you're like, here's my life. God, take it. You've purchased it. It's not mine anymore. Paul says you're dead wrong to say my obedience doesn't matter. This is what just obedience will produce. And I want you to hear this loud and clear. Our obedience <coughs> comes from what Christ has done for us, bringing a full salvation and giving us peace with God. Um, the law of Christ now flows from this faith. And we learn that the law of Christ in Romans 13 is to love God with your heart, mind, soul, and strengthen your neighbors yourself. The obedience of faith now is because I believe this gospel. I am loved and accepted. There is no condemnation right now for me. And nothing can separate me from the love of God in Christ Jesus. If I live into that, if I stay there and believe that, he's saying what is going to flow from you is love that you've never had before. Romans 7, 4, Therefore, my brethren, you were made to die to the law, to the body of Christ, that you might be joined to another, Jesus, to him who was raised from the dead, that we might bear fruit for God. That's the way you're going to get fruit, is dying to the law, dying to obedience, and coming and believing in Jesus Christ. You're joined to him in a marriage, and that marriage will produce the fruit of the Spirit in your life. Romans 8, 1, therefore there's now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. The law couldn't do that, weak as it was to the flesh, so God did it. He sent his son into the likeness of sinful flesh, and he made an, an offering for sin, and he condemned sin in the flesh on the cross so that a fruit will come out of it so that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Now, real, true, genuine love can flow out of us because God first loved us. And until you have faith and you live into that, you're just going to have a bunch of rules while your heart is gnarly and you don't really care about people. But when this breaks in, you love people and you love God. And your greatest joy is to obey God. You've been born again. This is what it does. This is faith. And our obedience flows from it. This gospel believed, trusted, and treasured brings about a love for God and other people that no power could ever bring about. So, obedience of faith is where we've been journeying our whole time together. And my prayer is that no one in here runs out and just tries to obey, but that you know what the obedience of faith is now. And it's changing your life and your heart because you can't get over the gospel. So does it end there? Go back to the end of the book. Chapter 16. We're going to close, kind of. Man, it doesn't end there. Okay, the chief end of the world is not our obedience of faith. 
right? Romans is saying it was to get you to obedience of faith. All that we've studied, all that we've looked at is to get you there. Why? To the only wise God through Jesus Christ be the glory forever. Amen. Let your light shine before men, the obedience of faith, in such a way that they see your good deeds and glorify your Father who's in heaven. We're to be so filled with love, Jesus, and difference, and a message that's unbelievable, that people are like, there's a God in this world. No one could be like that. No one. The world keeps trying to unify, and they can't. And Jesus Christ brings us together in a beautiful way. This is what it's all been leading to for his name's sake. This is the heart of the the Bible, to bring about obedience by faith to the glory of God alone. That's what everything's being written for. We want this gospel to work in our hearts and the hearts of our brothers and sisters as one body with one faith in this gospel. We manifest love so that the world will look and give glory to God. He's the only explanation for what's going on here this morning. If you're visiting and you see something beautiful in this place, it's from God. We're a bunch of gnarly creatures, and faith in Jesus Christ is changing and transforming us. It's from him and through him and to him. To him be the glory forever. Amen. And so, brethren, to him who's able to establish you this morning through this gospel, by the preaching of Jesus who was hidden for thousands of years and has been manifested, and we've seen him, that all the nations now who will believe will have the obedience of faith so that God would get all the glory alone. Amen. And the closing application that I've spent all week in my own heart is I want you sitting here and ask yourself, can you add the amen? And what the amen means is this is true. I'm with it. I believe this with all my heart. I grab this. I love this. It's mine. It's not enough to mark up your Bibles and mark up your notebooks. This has all been leading to this moment. Can you say amen to what Paul has just written in the book of Romans? And I, if you're five years old, this could be your day. Is, is it time to say amen to the gospel? Surrender my life. If you're 90, Today could be the day where you finally say amen that Jesus Christ has done it all by his death and his life. I believe this. This is where it's all leading to. It's not enough to nod. In your heart, can you say amen to the four years of what we've studied? Can I bank my life on this and entrust my whole soul and eternity to God's plan and gospel of Jesus Christ? Can you say amen to this gospel? Let's pray. Amen. Father, thank you for this gospel. It is the only wise God who could come up with this. We worship you, God, for this plan. We marvel at what we've seen, and we love that it's all in Jesus Christ. Glory be to Christ. Father, he is our only hope. He is the only way. He's the Savior. He's, his death is the only way. His life is the only righteousness that will ever work. We look away from anything in ourselves. There's no hope in us. And by faith, we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're justified and have peace with God. And that will begin to sanctify us and bring about the obedience of faith the life lived that comes from believing this, the supernatural love that will flow from us to you and to others. God, thank you for what this gospel does in every heart. I pray that there will be none in this room who can't say amen. Let them in the quietness of their heart before their God look at Jesus and say amen in faith. God, I pray this in the name of Jesus Christ.